Welcome to the Sowing Hope Podcast. This is a show all about implanting hope in our hearts. I'm Bill Snyder, joined by my friend Anne DeSantis. We're glad you're here for our uplifting conversation about faith and how it sustains our hearts through all the seasons of life. Thanks for walking with us. And good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Sewing Hope Podcast. I am Bill Snyder. It's great to be with you this evening and to continue our series on the Beatitudes. And as always, I'm joined by my friend and co-host, Anne DeSantis. Anne, how are you this evening? Oh, I'm awesome, Bill. Great to be here. I'm loving this series so far. It is. It's a great series, and it's a, you know, it's a wonderful thing to be able to uh, take a step back a little bit. I know we have great guests on all the time, and we love having guests on our program, but every once in a while it's nice to do a series like this where we can delve into a topic of our faith and really go deeply into it and and you know give people some hope from from the gospel. So it's so you know especially with the Beatitudes being a, a you know core part of what we believe and it's just just great. Yeah, it really is. And so this week we are at the second one, which is blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And this is from Matthew 5, 1 to 12. So we're at the second beatitude. And I think there's a lot for us to unpack when we think about blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Because I don't think there's one person who's listening right now who hasn't been affected by mourning in some way whether it's been something to do with the loss of a loved one, some kind of uh, heartache, or even what we went through in 2020, right, Bill? I mean, so there's so much that we can unpack there. And God is is teaching us something about himself with, with mourning. Yes. Mourning isn't always a bad thing, is it? I mean... No, I I think it's necessary. You know, mourning is a we're, the Christian life is about dying to self and rising to new life in Christ. I mean, we see that from the very first moment of our Christian initiation, right? We get dunked in the waters of baptism to die to sin and rise to new life. And that is really a very core piece of what we believe and so because of that, that we, that we come out of the waters of baptism in new life, we, we have to mourn any time that we turn back away from that new life. We have to mourn our, our sinfulness. We have to mourn the, the, the things that separate us um, you know, from God. We, we should have heartache over those things. We should have sadness that we've broken our vows and our, you know, and our and our covenants with God. Like we should have a real understanding of what that means. And I think oftentimes we get wrapped up with uh mourning being the death of a loved one. You know, you know, we mourn their loss. And certainly we do. Um but but it's it's even greater for us to mourn for our sins. Uh, you know, there's a there's a resource uh, that I that I often used in my confirmation classes with um, with my with my students and uh, when I would teach confirmation prep. And uh, it, it, it's a really wonderful resource by Father uh, Michael Champagne. And what he does is he takes the uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, and he and he lines up the eight beatitudes uh, with them, and it's and it's a really neat uh, uh, kind of kind of lining up that he does of of the eight beatitudes with this. And I and I just want to read to you how the the Holy Spirit gives us the conviction to weep for our for our own sinfulness. And this is what he says in in this document. It's a it's a wonderful document. It says, uh, the gift of knowledge allows us to judge correctly concerning the truths of faith in accord with their proper causes. It makes us see the emptiness of things created and the necessity of placing our complete trust in God. As this gift shows us the gravity of sin, it corresponds with the beatitude 
of those who weep for their sins or those who mourn, right? Those who weep for their sins and mourn, you know, is, is revealed to us through what? The gift of knowledge that the Holy Spirit pours into us at baptism. You know, that's when we get these gifts initially. And so it's, it's a beautiful way to, to, to kind of look at this. It doesn't mean we don't mourn the loss of our loved ones. It doesn't mean we don't mourn the loss of jobs and, and, and sickness and illness and all the temporal things that we mourn in this life. But we also, the, the, the chief thing we have to mourn is when we turn back, you know, away from God's plan for us and we say, you know, God, I didn't live the way you wanted me to. We have to have real sadness. And, and the very cool thing is that what does Jesus promise when we weep for our sins? What does Jesus promise when we mourn for, for, for our sins? He promises that we will receive comfort. You know, that's the promise that he will give us. If we repent, he gives us comfort. Beautifully said, Bill, because there is a difference there, like you said, with mourning for our sins and then mourning for the things of this life. And as you said, it doesn't mean that the things of this life that we mourn about are improper for us to cry over, right? It doesn't mean that. But what it means is that, you know, at the end of our lives, the most important thing is that we through God's grace can remove the barrier between us and God so that we can be with him forever in heaven. Right. I mean, and we all have that desire. I think, I think the human heart, all of us have a desire somewhere, even if it's hidden to do good. Um, And for some people, it's harder to find that because of circumstances of life, maybe because of the way they were raised or because of circumstances that were, beyond their own control, if that makes any sense. Um, Circumstances have a lot to do with the way things wind up, unfortunately, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, but God is bigger than all that. God is bigger than all that. But we just, I think we have to come to the conclusion, Bill, I think you may agree, that life is not going to be perfect. And I think that once we get beyond that, too, and say, you know what, I am in this world, it is a world of sin, but God is bigger. And through my own relationship with God and through the gifts like something like the Beatitudes and the sacraments of the Catholic Church, I can be closer to God. I can be one step closer to heaven and in fulfilling the mission that God has for me. But I think we have to come to that conclusion first that we're not going to have it completely perfect here in any way, shape, or form. It's just not going to happen. No, I know. And, you know, you, you make a great point with that because I, I would always tell you know, students, too, I would always tell them, you know, um, think about this. Have you been happy your entire life up until now? And they would say no. And then I said, well, what makes you think you're going to be happy your entire future from this moment forward? You know, and they would go, well that doesn't add up. I said, yeah, right. Two plus two doesn't equal five, you know? Uh, and, and you're not going to be happy. It's impossible to be happy your entire life, you know? And, and, and the people that chase that, right? Like that's, you know, that's part of it. People that chase happiness their entire life, you know, end up bouncing like a pinball from one, you know, thing to the next. They, they, they live a very shallow, superficial life that is based on the immediate need or the immediate gratification of that particular item. You know, yeah, I got the latest, greatest car. That isn't that isn't that great. And then, well, that car is out of style. Uh, I need a new one. Oh, those clothes, man. That man, I really like that. I really love that clothing. I'm going to go get that. And then two days later, you know, somebody says, oh, that doesn't look great on you. And you're like, wait a minute, this is supposed to be the latest trend in style. And so then they go bounce to the next thing to make them happy. And, and that is such an empty way of living. That is something, such an empty way of, of living that, yeah, we can never be completely happy our entire lives. You know, 
uh, something is going to derail the train. You know, typically it derails, you know, <laughs> as soon as we reach the age of reason, you know, <laughs> right? And, and uh, we, we understand, we understand that, you know what, it's not all about just being, just being happy because you're not going to be able to do it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and sometimes, Bill, I think before some of us have had conversions, and there's many people who listen to this podcast or friends of ours and even ourselves, right? Because I didn't really have a conversion until I was in my probably late 20s, early 30s, where I really turned around and said, you know, I need to get back to confession. I need to follow my faith and not be drawn into the things of the world that sometimes even when we sort of hop the fence and we become more devout and Catholic, those vices can still be there. We can still compete with other Catholics to be holy. We can still compete with other Catholics or Christians to be popular amongst our friends within the church circles and things like that too. So just because you're Catholic and following a deeper path, it doesn't mean that you're immune, right, to... Oh, no some of those vices that can happen to all of us, you know, um, I've seen it myself, even within, uh, the church and groups and organizations and church circles that that competitiveness can still exist. Like you said, um, favoritism, wanting to be best friends with the pastor for whatever reason, or something like that, if that makes sense. <laughs> Right. Uh, so those things still exist even within our faith. And we have to recognize that too, that it's not just in the world, right? I mean, right, right. No, you know, sometimes church culture gets like that. And, and even, um, you know, always coming into church with an agenda leaves you also feeling empty. You know, we are, we are, not always supposed to be pushing our agenda. Like, you know, we, we sit on, some people sit on different committees. Some people are on parish council. Some people are, you know, uh, lectors or, or whatever, you know, music ministers, or they're, they've, they've got great gifts and talents, but it's not all about, um, it's not all about just having your agenda be the most important, right? Like, well, you know, isn't the music ministry the best and we have to have every song this way and it's going to be, uh, or, or man, you know, I've been using this research, research materials and, and, and all these different resources in my confirmation programs since I was, you know, this, and I've been really good about doing that. You know, yeah, I'm, I, I'm really proud that you've been serving the church, but we can get so wrapped up in the, in that resource, in that agenda that we forget that we're there to truly serve the Lord and to truly, and, and if God wants a different resource, here's the key word. We have to mourn that loss properly. We have to say, okay, God, I understand you're taking this away from me for a period of time or forever, whatever you decide. But the good of the program, the good of the parishioners at the large, the good of the church, right? It is, it is about that. And that is hard. Believe me, I have struggled with that. You know, I have, I, I, I've seen that firsthand, you know, and I've struggled with it firsthand, you know, and we have to, all of us, especially in church culture, have to do a good job of being able to say, Okay, God, I'm going to give this to you, and I'm going to mourn the loss of this. You know, I'm going to mourn the loss of this because maybe I pushed myself, maybe I kind of became too prideful. And, and you know, mourning in this sense is really repenting, right? It's really repenting, saying, I got a little too big for my britches. I got a little bit too, uh, you know, involved in this. I made it about me and not about you, and I'm sorry, and so that's that's where we have to go with it. Yeah, absolutely, Bill. And I think it's that recognition, too, of pride in our lives. You know, ev I think everyone has been affected by pride. You know, everyone has been affected by that whole idea of, you know, what's important to me is the most important thing. 
and that my ideas are the ones that everybody says, oh, that was great. Let's do it. <laughs> and it's not the way that life happens. And that's a warning, as you said, it's a warning to let that go and say, you know what? This is a collective effort, really. Life is a collective effort with God's church. That's what it really means to be part of the Catholic church is that we are all part of it. It doesn't mean that each person isn't individually special and beloved and an, an, an immortal soul that was created by God that is you know, priceless. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're not still recognizing all of that, but we have to also recognize that we're part of one great big, I don't want to say puzzle, but something like that, right? Yeah. We're all one big part of that. And, um, you know, I think what our Holy Father, Pope Francis, is calling us since the beginning of his pontificate is to reach out to those who are marginalized, those who feel not accepted by the world, those who don't have family, those who feel not part of something, right? And we, our job is to turn around and recognize who they are, because sometimes those people are even within our own families, they're within our own churches, they're within our own neighborhoods. And one of the things that Pope Francis has said was that Jesus teaches us not to be ashamed of touching human misery, of touching his flesh and our brothers and sisters who suffer. And that's also part of blessed are those who mourn because when we mourn, you know, Bill, as Bill said, and as I said too, we're mourning for the sins of our own and all, and also of the world, but we're also mourning with people who suffer. Yeah. And I think that that's a, a recognition for all of us. Of how do we get to heaven? Part of that way that we get to heaven is we, when we recognize the suffering Christ on earth in our own lives, whether it's ourselves or other people, and we accompany that person and we don't walk away and say, Oh, well, somebody else will help them. And that's true. You know, somebody else may help them, but maybe not. And maybe we're the ones being called even just to listen to someone. I think listening is just a gift that not many people have the ability to give these days. Everybody wants to talk and fix things and say what they need to say, but not a lot of people have the ears that are open to listen to other people's stories. Yeah, you're exactly right. And and the people that are out there suffering, I, I, I'm just going to tell a couple stories. The first one, um, you know, it comes from a couple weeks ago. I think it was last week, actually, on Friday night or something. Um, I had just finished working. I just finished driving Uber or whatever. And um, talk about that suffering of people and seeing it, you know, and then having to react to it. Um, I, uh, it's a hard time right now for everybody. I just finished working, you know, and, and I called my wife and, and I said, you know, you want me to bring home, home something for dinner? Uh, you know, what do you want to do? And, and, and she goes, well, okay, how about we get some cheesesteaks? And I was like, okay. So, uh, by the way, the Philly cheesesteaks are much better than the Wisconsin cheesesteaks there. You know, there's nothing to be compared. Uh, but, but, but I went out there and, um, went over to the, to, to Charlie's and, and picked up. Uh, some cheese steaks, and on uh, on the way in the store, I got out of my car on the way in the store. Uh, this this gentleman was standing outside the store, and he was freezing cold, and uh, and you know whatever he he was just really hard up, and he asked me, he goes, "Do you have any money for for uh, some something over to eat at Taco Bell?" And I said, you know what? I'm all out of cash. And uh, I realized at that point I had forgotten my mask in my car. And I turned around. I went back to my car to get my to get my face mask so I could walk in the store. I walked by him again. And when I walked by him again, I just said to him, you know, uh, I'm going in Charlie's. I do you want me just to place an order for you? You want me just to place an order for for, for, uh, for of a cheesesteak for you? And um, he goes, right now they're not letting anybody in to eat there. You couldn't sit down and eat at the table. Um, but, but I can at least bring it out to you. And he goes, Oh, that would be great. I would love a cheesesteak. And so, um, so I said, no, you know, no problem. Uh, and, and I, and I ordered them a cheesesteak and I'll tell you what, you know, like I walked out and I handed it to him, you know, sometimes you're like, 
worried is this person you know want you know money is he going to you know sell it but i mean it's not going to sell food right so 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 you know the people who are in need when the holy spirit kind of just plays on your heart you no know, let me just ask this person you know do you want something you know I, just like there was another uh, guy i drove past uh, maybe a month or two ago and i had some extra food sitting in the front of my car and he was you know on, on the street i said hey i got a bunch of food for you would you like would you like uh, me to give you this you know bag of food here and um, and he goes no no thank you for the food and you know he was just you know trying to scam you know whatever and and uh, may- maybe he had some real need but it wasn't it wasn't uh, he wasn't looking for food he was looking for money to maybe go buy alcohol or drugs or something um, but but this gentleman you know was really appreciative in fact when I handed him the the box when I when I left Charlie's the other night he opened it immediately you know put it on top of a trash can and just devoured it. Uh, and by the way, it was like like a negative three degrees outside, and so it was just just dangerous, you know, uh, to even be outside. Uh, and and so I just you know lifted up a prayer and and uh, you know said you know God protect him from this. But yeah, we have to enter into those situations, and and we have to be open to the Holy Spirit, you know, just to provide. And and where you talk about the morning is, you know. And you know to to kind of unite yourself with the poor, unite yourself with those with those situations, right? Like 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 my heart hurt, my my heart hurt for him as I drove away. I was like, I, you know, I I wish I could do more for you. Like, and, and I told him that I was like, I wish I could do more for you. I, I am so sorry to see you suffering in this condition. You know, it's negative three degrees outside at six o'clock at night in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and you do have no don't have any place to maybe stay. Or maybe you do, I don't know, but you don't have any food to eat, or you're hungry, you know. Um, and and how can we not mourn with that person? How can we not say, oh my God, please help this person? That's what I drove away saying, like, God, just help this person. You know, send send another angel to help them, you know, because, because they need it. Oh, that's a beautiful story, Bill. And I think God sends people like that into our lives all the time sometimes in an instance like you just described. And uh, I think throughout our lives, whether it be something within our own families or with uh, church friends or in school, I think a lot of times in school that happens too, where, you know, there's somebody who's kind of being marginalized in some way that isn't part of the group. I mean, I think in some way, shape or form, all of us have experienced that growing up in some way where maybe we didn't feel part of a group or something. And, uh, and that's a way to recognize someone who needs a friend, right? When you're there and realizing that somebody's by themselves and someone is mourning and someone could use a phone call. Uh, you know, that's an important thing, I think, for all of us to realize that how can we be Jesus for those who are mourning? That's a good question. And another quote I have from the Holy Father, he said, we, we Christians will be credible witnesses of mercy to the extent that forgiveness, renewal, and rec- reconciliation are daily experienced in our midst. Together, we can proclaim and manifest God's mercy concretely and joyfully by upholding and promoting the dignity of every person. Without this service to the world and in the world, Christian faith is incomplete. So, you know, it's, I think what I'm hearing is from him that it's a job for each person to take it upon themselves, you know, but we have to exercise those virtues that you listed off or that you were talking about in that one document that you sent me, Bill, and you were discussing about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And when we have the gift of knowledge, I'll read it again. It said, it allows us to judge correctly concerning the truths of the faith in accordance of their proper causes. It makes us see the emptiness of created things and the necessity of placing our complete trust in God as this gift shows us the gravity of sin. It corresponds with the beatitude of those who weep for their sins. So it's a combination, isn't it? Of like weeping for sin and our own sin and also being Christ for those who are mourning. I think it's kind of twofold there. It is. And, and it's the knowledge to recognize, you know, when, when you have those situations, 
you know, that's that's the gift of knowledge to be able to recognize, okay, I need to enter here. I need to provide comfort here, right? Like, yes, I... And 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 by providing the comfort, here's the thing: by 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 living as Christ, by providing the comfort for others, um, which we we end up bringing the kingdom to earth. Like that's just what happens. Like we bring the kingdom of heaven to earth when we comfort other people in their in their brokenness. You know, and and the amazing thing is, then we also find the comfort that we need in in our brokenness. You know, we find comfort in our situations from other people who are the who are the hands and feet of Christ in our lives, and we are then called as as you were talking about, Anne, to go out and then share that gift with with others to be comfort to others like we you know it has to become a circle you know a circular thing it has to become a cyclical thing we have to do this in cycle and you know once we drop the chain part of the chain you know okay well we say um up oh, jesus gave me comfort from my sins um, you know, he, he, uh, you know, I've repented from them. I've, you know, I, I've done all my job, but then I don't go out and help the next person do that. Then have we really repented? Have we really helped? Have we really entered into that situation to help others with, with, with the, with the intent of, you know, repenting from our sin? Because once we repent from our sin, once we say, God, I, I don't want to live this way, and I'm truly sorry, and I have this knowledge now that I don't want to be, live this way. Um, how do we, how do we move, you know, how do we, we, we have to move in action to help our brothers and sisters. There's nothing more that we, you know, you know, you, you, like, like, like the, the fire of the Holy Spirit is planted in us. You know, we, we don't just sit on our hands and feet and go, yay, Jesus saved me, amen. Like, I'm going to heaven. Like, that's, that. I I just can't see that, you know? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's not a once and done. And for some of us, life is shorter, right? There's people who, who die at a younger age. Um, but I think for a great deal of us, it goes into middle age and older and even very, very old age. So we do have time, right? Most of us, I think, have some time to get it right and to try to uh, really understand what God's mission is for us. You know, the mission, I think, is simpler than we think, too. We're really called to love. I know Mother Teresa said that a lot, St. Saint, Saint Teresa of Calcutta. We are really called to bring love to others, and our families are really the first place, she says. Our families are the place that we love others first. Uh, and, and God gives us our families as a gift. So we just have to remember that. Um, and virtue begins there too, doesn't it? I mean, the way that we treat people in our own household. Uh, and I think bringing it to prayer. Prayer is big too when it comes to all this. Don't you think, Bill? I mean, we can't do any of this without a relationship with God. And that has to, that really does happen when we take it to prayer. And develop that prayer life with God, which is our communication, both to hear what he's saying and also to uh, to talk to him. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if, if we don't pray, if we do not enter into the prayer relationship that we have with God and, you know, prayer isn't always the the our father. You know, it's in always the Hail Mary or the Rosary. Those, the, those things certainly do help. I mean, our good friend Kendra Von Esch, you know, is, is a wonderful person who will teach you how to pray. So if you're looking for some great prayer resources, uh, visit her website and, and, and some of her uh, wonderful methods. I certainly, I, I know you endorse them too. She's got some great uh, efforts to teach people how to pray. But the, the reality is it's a conversation with God. You know, I mean, yes, the rosary is wonderful. Yes, the Divine Mercy Chaplet is wonderful. Yes, all of these, all of these scripted prayers or these rote prayers are um, wonderful, and and we need them. But 
but the interior conversation, that conversation that goes on in inside of us each and every day, right? Like that is important that we that we have that conversation with God, and then we bring com- bring God into our thoughts. We bring Him into our into our consciences. We bring Him into our mind, and we allow Him to enter in to us, and um, you know that once we have that figured out, then the Our Father and the Hail Mary and the Rosary all have, we unlock the power of those prayers after we have the relationship. But if you, if you just start trying to say an Our Father or a Hail Mary, you know, it seems so, you know, rote or empty at times. You're like, okay, I'm going to blow through my Rosary in 15 minutes, right? I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to get, you know, the Divine Mercy Chaplet done in eight minutes. Uh, you know, bo- both of which I've done, you know, numerous times in my life, right? Like, I'm just going to, you know, get through this where I don't have to really enter into that interior conversation with God and say, all right, God, what do you want to teach me through this prayer? You know, and and as you mentioned, you know, offering it up, offering it up through love, right? I mean, like, we got we have to offer the prayer up, for those in the church that are suffering, hurting. Um, when, when we pray with intention, there's a reason why we call it intentions, but when we have to also pray with intention, we have to say, okay, yes, I am praying for this. The people out there suffering from this, they need our prayers. The people out there hurting from these things, we need to think about them. We need to bring them into our lives. We have to react to the situations that God puts us in, um, you know, totally. Yeah, Bill, you said it so well. I mean, uh, it really is a relationship because you can do those prayers in such a rote way that you almost think to yourself, well, that really didn't do a thing because <laughs> I just wanted to get it over with. But the fact is that God knows there was some effort made. So it's still a prayer, right? Even if it wasn't, it's, even if it didn't feel like one, But one thing that I know that it's helped me is to uh, spend some time, especially I think in the morning for me, is just kind of like contemplative prayer, you know, Uh, reading some good books or meditations and really reflecting, you know, thinking about what did I just read? What is God teaching me? Even if it's just one or two lines, it doesn't have to be that you read, you know, 25 pages, but reading some meditation that helps you to uh, be grounded with God. Like right now, I have a book my daughter gave me from Henry Nowen called "You Are the uh, You Are the Beloved," and actually for today's meditation, it talks about solitude and how by slowly converting our loneliness into a deep solitude, we create that precious space where we can discover the voice telling us about our inner necessity. That is our vocation. And I think when we think about our vocation, we may focus on the fact that, okay, well, I'm a married woman or Bill's a married man or somebody's a priest or religious. But we also have that vocation as Christians that we got from our baptism, right? Our baptismal call to holiness, to relationship with God, to be a part of the kingdom and to invite others and to spread the gospel. And that's our vocation, isn't it? And I think that that vocation also combines with the vocation to be there for people who are mourning, as we said, recognize the mourning of our own sins. And I think that also, when we think about those mourning of our own sins, remembering that that sacrament of confession is a way that we can do that. And, you know, during this pandemic, yes, it's been hard to get to mass for some people as often, or maybe some of the churches are still not operating, operating up to full capacity. Uh, but the sacrament of reconciliation, I think for the most part, uh, churches and priests are still offering it, you know, sometimes with the social distancing and the proper, uh, things that need to be done at this time. Um, and maybe by the time we're airing this podcast, things will be in a much better direction because we're airing, we're taping this in February of 2021 and we don't know exactly when it's going to air, but sometime in the spring, right, Bill? Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, I think that for somebody who's listening and hasn't been to confession in a while, I would say consider going back because God is calling you and you will be able to release those sins and give yourself some comfort from mourning the loss of some of the things that you feel places in your own life where maybe you felt you went wrong because we all do everybody does at some point or another right we all sin and we all fall short of the glory of god at some point in our lives and sometimes it's more often than others but you know, do stay close to God because you will get a visit from Jesus when you do that. Yeah. You will meet him face to face. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, you, you you get comforted. You get the comfort of God. Like, that is the promise of the Beatitude. You know, we talk a lot about comfort, right? I was reading some meme on the internet the other day, and, you know, we have sought out more comfort. You know, Pope Benedict, this Pope Emeritus Benedict, he he talked about he said we had one of the greatest lines I think at a World Youth Day, when he said, uh, "You know the world will promise you comfort, but you were not made for comfort. You were made for greatness, right?" And and society throws that word comfort around an awful lot. You're going to be comforted by, again, the latest possession or the latest, greatest thing. But the comfort that God is giving you is something totally different, right? He's, he's not talking about giving you the latest iPhone or the best house. or he, He's not comforting you with that. He's comforting you with knowing that, man, when you mourn, when you mourn, that you've separated yourself in so many different ways from my love and and you really are upset about it. I'm going to step in and say, no more tears. I'm going to step in and say, welcome home. Like, that's the ultimate comfort. You know, all the world can offer you when it talks about comfort is a heated seat in your car. You know what I mean? Like, you know, <laughs> like that's that's what I think about often when I think about comfort, you know? It's like, yeah, I got my heated seat. I got my five-star restaurant. You know, I've got, you know, these these really great items. But if if we put our entire life around those and, and comfort, you're always going to be needing to have more. You know, the, you know, as I said, you can't be happy your whole life. You pinball from instant gratification to instant gratification to instant gratification, and and you never say, "Hey, wait a minute. Um, let me address some of the real needs that I have." So yes, the world can promise you comfort. It can promise you the external comfort of having a heated seat in your car. It can promise you the uh, comfort of having the latest gadget, but it that's it, that is the farthest it can go. You know, <laughs> like that is <laughs> yeah. the farthest it can go. So, so trust the comfort of God, which is a totally different comfort. It's it's recognizing that no matter what you've done, where you've been, if you go back to you know your interior life and you say, God, man, I. I've spent a, a thousand days away from here, you know, away from my relationship with you, right? You know, isn't that isn't that where the psalmist comes in? I forget what psalm it is, but um, I'm sure it's a psalm of David. You know, you know, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Like, I love that psalm because I know I've spent a thousand elsewhere, and I know that if I spend one day. <laughs> You know, in the courts, but then I've canceled out the thousand elsewhere, you know, and I know that I spend another day in his courts, then I've canceled, you know, 2000 days elsewhere. Um, and, and Lord knows I've spent years away from him and I've spent, you know, far, you know, I, I've, I, I've wandered in my path like many people have, you know, and, and, um, but I'm, but I'm comforted in knowing that, man, 
better is one day. And if we go back and we focus on our relationship with God and we say, you know what, I am truly sorry for that. And, and we weep for it. We mourn for it. We say, God, I, I want to be back with you. Then guess what? He's going to give you the comfort. Yes, indeed, Bill. Very well said. Uh, and you know what? The other thing I was thinking as you were talking also is that um, you're right. It is not about that earthly comfort. But I do think sometimes that when we surrender to God with whatever that is, whether it's a prayer for somebody else or for ourselves, that God will provide. Now, it doesn't mean, like you said, you, you might not have the best of everything in your life, but he will provide for your needs. Um, it's just a matter of surrendering it and saying, you know what, God, maybe I'm not comfortable, but you know, this is my prayer. I'm praying for this person's health. I'm praying for this person to be provided for. I'm praying for my own family, for us to be able to make ends meet. Right. And so we just give that to God and, you know, we have to trust that God will provide somehow, some way for us. And, and I do think that he does in many ways, maybe not in the ways we expect. Right, exactly. And that's, and that's the thing, you know, God, he, he, there was a very smart Franciscan when I was in uh, the seminary discernment that, you know, um, a lot of people come into their, their discernment programs now having gone to college and, and it um, hampers them a lot. You know, we, we had somebody on our program earlier this, this year uh, or last year, late last year, um, who, who entered now in uh, v v Victoria Clarizio. She is now in, um, you know, discernment uh, and, and entered fully into the uh, convent. But that popped into my mind because, you know, God does provide. Like, she had serious debt, you know, serious debt from all of her college and, and learning and everything. Um, and she, you know, you can't take a life of poverty you can't take vows of poverty if you have this uh, hanging over your head. It just doesn't work. And so, um, you know, great societies, there's great people out there, like the Laborate Society, that um, band together and help people fundraise so that they can pursue their vocation, so that they can pursue those things. And, you know, God provides. God provided for her in that situation. She was able to raise an exorbitant amount of money. I think it was something like $30,000 worth of money in in six or eight months because, you know, the Lord is going to provide. And, you know, he created... The other thing I think that it lends itself to is realizing, Anne, that God created everything. He created the world. And then he said to us, you know, here, this is all for you. You get dominion over all of it. And so then knowing that he created us, we created other things, Right? Like, like he knows, he created our minds to be able to develop uh, medicines and vaccines. And like, you know, you know when you think about it from, from that standpoint, like we have uh, been charged with the ability to co-create with God. He's given us the ability to do these things. And so, you know, like... Where, where, where you talk about God will provide, he provides in the most unorthodox ways. I mean, you know, here we are struggling through, you know, a pandemic, you know, and, and God, has, God has provided for people in their financial need. He has provided for people in their, in their health need. Has every person been saved? No. But what do we have now through the minds of human beings that he willed into existence? We have vaccines. We have medical care that is treating people and helping people. Like, you know, he doesn't take away all the suffering. He doesn't take away all the, all that, you know, he came to die on the cross too. Like, like he didn't just wipe it all away. He, he, he could have held up a white flag and said, you don't we, don't. we don't have to suffer anymore. He could have done that. He could have said, "All done." He didn't. He said, "I'm coming to suffer with you. I'm coming to die for you." And he entered our humanity, and he created 
all of this for us to use and to to be a to to use for his glorification that's what it's for you know it's for his glorification that he created us with the mind that we have and when we do these things you know here's the big thing when when we do it with him in mind and we do it for him we have greater success right ann like yes we, right Oh, absolutely, Bill. You said it so well. And I have to say, when you were talking about co-create and creating, uh, congratulations to you, because by the time this podcast airs, well, you're already a dad now when we're taping this in February, but congratulations to you and Agnes on the birth of little Elvin. So, yeah. so happy. So that's how God is working in your life, Bill. And yeah. It's, We're uh, also happy for you and your wife and how God is providing for you. Exactly. And, you know, I mean, it, 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 it works. You know, every day when we go to bed at night, you know, being able to say, you know what, God, thank you for the roof over my head. Thank you for the food that I ate tonight. Thank you for, like, God provide. God provides. Like, you know, the, the other thing I've often thought about, especially in conjunction with, with God providing, you know, in the Our Father, we say the words, give us this day our daily bread. You know, we don't say, give us this day our bread for the next five years. You know, like, 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 no, we say, give us this day our daily bread, provide for us today. And I know you're going to provide for me tomorrow because you're, you're there. But here's the thing. If God was to just provide five years worth of bread, right? If he was just to say, all right, here you go. For the next five years, you're good. Like if he was to provide like that, um, we, we would be, we would sit on our butt and we would go, all right, yay, God provided. Um, and we completely forget about him, right? Like if he provided for every one of our needs for the entirety of our life, we would never actually have a need to get to know him, a need for relationship with him. Like, think about, think about your own relationships too, Anne, right? Like, you know, you think about, you know, what, what, what you do with work, what you do with, you know, coworkers, what you do with your family. Like, we're all, in, we're all interdependent on each other in some way in our little nuclear families. Like, okay, you know what? Somebody's going to cook dinner tonight. Somebody's going to you know, be home. Like we, we, we have needs and you know what? They are daily needs. They're not, you know, can you imagine if somebody said, Oh, here's the next five meals in your free, you know, five, five years worth of meals in your freezer. You're never going to have to, you know, go, go hungry again. Like, wait a minute. Does that, does that really work? Does that really compute? No, we would just forget about that person. We'd be like, Oh, thanks. Yeah. Good. You know? Yeah. No, it makes complete sense. Yeah. And life is, is, is an unfolding and I think that when we've unpacked this one so well, that blessed are those who mourn. I think we did a good job. Uh, I hope we did, right, Bill? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, with unpacking this. But, you know, there's always more to learn. So I want to just encourage you who are listening to read the Beatitudes, learn more about it. You know, it's more in more than just one place in the Bible, too. I mean, we read it from Matthew 5, but it's, it's also in other sections of the Bible, so, uh, you know, there's so much to learn there. I think it's an important lesson for all of us. And, you know, as Catholics and as Christians, we never stop learning, right? We have to keep learning. It's not a once and done. So, Bill, yeah. thanks so much for everything on this podcast. Oh, of course. Yeah. Uh, th this is, you know, it's so awesome to see how the Holy Spirit works. Mm -hmm. right? It's so awesome to see how the Holy Spirit works together. Um, and, and, and certainly I know it's, I know it's giving, uh, me some amazing, um, you know, insights too. just having this conversation. So, so I, I'm learning a lot and I hope our listeners are learning and I, I know you're learning a lot too. I just, we're just learning with one another. We're growing in faith. And, uh, and so thank you for, thank you for spending the time and it's always fun to do this. Oh, you too, Bill. And we'll see everybody next time for the third beatitude. Yes, we will. And that would be. The uh, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. If you want to read ahead uh, to next week, feel free to do that. And uh, know that we'll be with you once again. But until then, 
Keep beating to your Catholic hearts, sowing hope into those broken hearts. I'm Bill Snyder. Thanks for listening to this episode of Sowing Hope on Patchwork Heart Radio. For more information about this podcast and our ministries, visit our websites, patchworkheart.org and andesantis.com. You can also follow and interact with us on Twitter at PWH Ministry or Andy Santos too.